Hey everyone and welcome to another edition of Zoom Hersels. Tonight we're going to try something very different. We're going to try uh, a reading of the classic French piece of uh, theater, Tartuffe. We're not going to explain anything, we're just going to start reading. So uh, yeah, let's take it away. Act one. Come, come, Flippot. It's time I left this place. I can't keep up. You walk at such a pace. Don't trouble, child. No need to show me out. It's not your manners I'm concerned about. We merely pay you the respect we owe. But, Mother, why this hurry? Must you go? I must. This house appalls me. No one in it will pay attention for a single minute. Children, I take my leave much vexed in spirit. I offer good advice, but you won't hear it. You all break in and chatter on and on. It's like a madhouse with the keeper gone. If... Girl, you talk too much, and I'm afraid you're far too saucy for a lady's maid. You push in everywhere and have your say. But... You, boy, grow more foolish every day. To think my grandson should be such a dunce. I've said a hundred times, if I've said it once, that if you keep the course on which you've started, you'll leave your worthy father brokenhearted. I think... And you, his sister, seem so pure, so shy, so innocent, and so demure. But you know what they say about still waters. I pity parents with secretive daughters. Now, mother... And as for you, child, let me add that your behavior is extremely bad, and a poor example for these children, too. Their dear dead mother did far better than you. You're much too free with money, and I'm distressed to see you so elaborately dressed. When it's one husband's that when it's one's husband that one aims to please, one has no need for of costly fripperies. Oh, madam, really? You are her brother, sir, and I respect and love you. Yet if I were my son, this lady's good and pious spouse, I wouldn't make you welcome in my house. You're full of worldly counsels for which I fear aren't suitable for decent folk to hear. Your man Tartuffe is full of holy speeches. And practices precisely what he preaches. He's a fine man and should be listened to. I will not hear him mocked by fools like you. Good God. Do you expect me to submit to the tyranny of that carping hypocrite? Must we forego all joys and satisfactions because that bigot censures at our actions? To hear him talk, and he talks all the time. There is nothing one can do that's not a crime. He raves at everything, your dear Tartuffe. Whatever he reproves deserves reproof. He's out to save your souls, and all of you must love him, as my son would have you do. Ah, uh, no, Grandmother. I could never take to such a rascal, even for my father's sake. That's how I feel, and I shall not dissemble. His every action makes me seethe and tremble with helpless anger, and I have no doubt that he and I will shortly have it out. Surely it is a shame and a disgrace to see this man usurp the master's place, to see this beggar who, when first he came, had not a shoe or shoestring to his name. So far forget himself that he behaves as if the house were his and we his slaves. Well, mark my words, your souls would fare far better if you obeyed his precepts to the letter. You see him as a saint. I'm far less old. In fact, I see right through him. He's a fraud. Nonsense. You all regard him with distaste and fear because he tells you what you're loath to hear, condemns your sins, points out your moral flaws, and humbly strives to further heaven's cause. If sin is all that bothers him, why is it? He is so upset when folk drop in to visit. Is heaven so outraged by a social call that he must prophesy against us all? I will tell you what I think. If you ask me, is jealous of my mistress company. Rubbish. He's not a lone child in complaining of all your promiscuous entertaining. Why, the whole neighborhood's upset, I know. By all these carriages that come and go, with crowds of guests parading in and out, 
and noisy servants loitering about. In all this, I'm sure there's nothing vicious, but why give people cause to be suspicious? They need no cause. They'll talk in any case. Madam, the world would be a joyless place if fearing what malicious tongues might say. We locked our doors and turned our friends away. One cannot fight slander, it's a losing battle. Let us instead ignore their tittle-tattle. Let's strive to live by conscious, clear decrees and let the gossips gossip as they please. If there is talk against us, I know the source. It's Daphne and her little husband, of course. Those who have greatest cause for guilt and shame are quickest to bismarck a neighbor's name. When there is a change for libel, they never miss it. When something can be made to seem illicit, they are off at once to spread the joyous news, adding to facts what fantasies they choose by talking up their neighbors' indiscretions. They seek to camouflage their own transgressions, hoping that others' innocent affairs will lend a hue of innocence into theirs, or that their own black guilt will come to seem part of a general shady color scheme. All that is quite irrelevant. I doubt that anyone's more virtuous and devout than dear Orante, and I'm informed that she condemns your mode of life so most vehemently. Oh, yes. She is strict, devout, and has no taint of worldliness. In short, she seemed a saint. But it was time which taught her that disguise she does because she can be otherwise. So long as her attractions could entrail, she flaunts and flirted and adjoined it all. But now that they're no longer what they were, she quits a world which fast is quitting her and wears a veil of virtue to conceal her bankrupt beauty and her lost appeal. That sort of talk is what you like to hear. Therefore, you'd have us all keep still, my dear. While Madame rattles on the live long day, nevertheless, I mean to have my say. I tell you that you're blessed to have Tartuffe dwelling as my son's guest beneath this roof, that heaven has sent him to forestall its wrath by leading you once more. I heard uh, that laugh, sir, and I saw that wink. Go find your silly friends and laugh some more. Enough, I'm going. Don't show me to the door. I leave this household much dismayed and vexed. I cannot say when I shall see you next. <laughs> Wake up. Don't stand there gaping into space. I'll slap some sense into that stupid face. Move. Move, you slut. Scene two, Fleant and Doreen. I think I'll stay behind. I want no further pieces of her mind. How that old lady... <sighs> What would she, wouldn't she say if she could hear you speak of her that way? She would thank you for the lady, but I'm sure she'd find the old a little premature. My, what a scene she's made and what a din. And how this man Tartuffe has taken her in. Yes, but her son is even worse deceived. His folly must be be seen to be believed in the late troubles he played to be able, an able part and serve the government with wise and loyal heart, but he's quite lost his sense since he fell and he started to inflatuating spell. He calls him brother and he loves him as his life, prefer him to mother, child or wife. In him and him alone will he confide. He's made him his confessor and his guide. He pets and pampers him with love more tender than any pretty mistress could engender. Gives him the place of honor when they dine. Delights to see him gorge him like a swine stuffs him with dainties till his guts distend 
And when he Belshus cries, God bless you, friend, Tartuf, much pleased to find so easy a victim, as in a hundred ways, pickled it and tricked him, milked him of money, and with his permission, established here a sort of inquisition. Even Laurent, his lackey dares to give us arrogant advice on how to live. He sermonizes in thundering tones and confiscates our ribbons and colognes. Last week, he tore our kerchief into pieces because he found it pressed in the life of Jesus. He said it was a sin to just oppose and holy vanities and holy prose. Scene three, Elmir, Marianne, Dami, Cleon, Doreen. Jamie, you play, Jamie, you play uh, Dami, okay, please? Okay, okay. Action. You did well not to follow. She stood in the door and said verbatim all she'd said before. I saw my husband coming. I think I'd best, I'd best go upstairs now and take a little rest. I'll wait and greet him here, then I must go. I've really only time to say hello. Sound him about my sister's wedding, please. I think Tartus against it, and that he's been urging father to withdraw his blessing. As you well know, I'd find that most distressing. Unless my sister and Valera can marry, my hopes to wed his sister will miscarry, and I'm determined. He's coming. Scene four, or gone. Cleant Doreen. Ah, brother, good day. Well, welcome back. I'm sorry I can't stay. How is the country? Blooming, I trust, and green? Excuse me, brother, just one moment. Doreen, to put my mind at rest, I always learn the household news the moment I return. Has all been well these two days I've been gone? How are the family? What's been going on? Your wife, two days ago, had a bad fever and a fierce headache which refused to leave her. Ah, uh, and Tartuffe? Tartuffe? Why, he's round and red, busting with health and excellently fed. Poor fellow. That night, the mistress was unable to take a single bite at the dinner table. Her headache pains, she said, were simply hellish. Ah, uh, and Tartuffe? He ate his meal with relish and zealously devoured in her presence a leg of mouton and a brace of pheasants. Poor fellow. Well, the pains continue strong and so she tossed and tossed the whole night long. Now icy cold, now burning like a flame, we sat beside her bed till morning came. Ah. Oh. And Tartuffe? Why? Having eaten your rose and sought his room, already in a doze, got to his warm bed and snored away in perfect peace until the break of day. Poor fellow. After much ado, we took her into dispatching someone for the doctor. He bled her and the fever quickly fell. Ah, and Tartuffe? He bore it very well to keep his cheerfulness at any cost and make up for the blood Madame had lost. He drank, at lunch, four bakers full of port. Poor fellow. Both are doing well, in short. I uh, will go and tell Madame that you have expressed keen sympathy and anxious interest that girl was laughing in your face and though i've no wish to offend you even so i'm bound to say she had some good excuse how can you possibly be such a goose are you dazed by this man's hocus pocus that all the world save him is out of focus you've given him clothing shelter food and care why must you also brother Stop right there. You do not know the man of whom you speak. I grant you that, but my judgment's not so weak. That 
I can't tell by his effect on others. Ah, when you meet him, you too will be like brothers. There's been no loftier soul since time began. He is a man who, a man who, an excellent man. To keep his precepts is to be reborn and view this dunghill of a world with scorn. Yes, thanks to him, I'm a changed man indeed. Under his tutelage, my soul's been freed from earthly loves and every human tie. My mother, children, brother, and wife could die and I'd not feel a single moment's pain. That's a fine sentiment, brother. Oh, most had, humane. Oh, had you seen Tartuffe as I first knew him, your heart, like mine, would have surrendered to him. He used to come into our church each day and humbly kneel nearby and start to pray. He'd draw the eyes of everybody there by the deep fervor of his heartfelt prayer. He'd sigh and weep, and sometimes with a sound of rapture, he would bend and kiss the ground. His serving man, no Less devout than he informed me of his master's poverty. I gave him gifts, but in his humbleness, he begged me every time to give him less. Oh, that's too much, he'd cry. Too much by twice. I don't deserve it. The half, sir, would suffice. And when I wouldn't take it back, he'd share half of it with the poor right then and there. At length, heaven prompted me to take him in to dwell with us and to protect my honor, stays by my wife and keeps an eye upon her. He tells me whom she sees and it's all she does and seems more jealous than I ever was. Good God. Have you lost your common sense? Or is this all some joke at my expense? How can you stand there and in all sobriety? Brother, your language savors of impiety. Too much free thinking's made your faith unsteady. And as I've warned you many times already, it will get you into trouble before you're through. So I've been told by, before by dupes like you. Being blind, you'd have all others blind as well. The clear-eyed man you call an infidel, and he who sees through humbug and pretense is charged by you with want of reverence? Spare me your warnings, brother. I have no fear of speaking out for you and heaven to hear against affected zeal and pious knavery that's there's true and false in piety as in bravery. And just as those who, whose courage shines the most in battle are the least inclined to boast, so those whose hearts are truly pure and lowly don't make a flashy show of being holy. There's a vast difference, so it seems to me, between true piety and hypocrisy. Ah, brother, man, strangely fashioned creature who seldom is content to follow nature, but recklessly pursues his inclination beyond the narrow bounds of moderation, and often by transgressing reason's laws, perverts a lofty aim or noble cause. A passing observation, but it applies. I see, dear brother, that you're profoundly wise. You harbor all the insight of the age. You are our one clear mind, our only sage. Brother, I don't pretend to be a sage, nor have I all the wisdom of the age. That's just one insight I would dare to claim. I know that true and false are not the same. And just as there is nothing I more revere than a soul whose faith is steadfast and sincere, nothing that I more cherish and admire than honest zeal and true religious fire, so there is nothing that I find more base than specious piety's dishonest face. Now then, dear brother, is your speech concluded? Why, yes. Your servant, sir. No, brother, wait. There's uh, one more matter. You agreed of late that young Valer might have your daughter's hand. I did. And set the date, I understand? Quite so. And you now postponed it, is it true? No doubt. The match no longer pleases you? Who knows? Do you mean to go back on your word? I won't say that. Which might entitle you to break your pledge? Perhaps. Why must you hem and haw and hedge? The boy asked me to sound you in this affair. It's been a pleasure. But what shall I tell Valer? Whatever you like. But what have you decided? What are your plans? 
I plan, sir, to be guided by heaven's will. Come, brother. Don't talk rot. You've given Valer your word. Will you keep it or not? Good day. This looks like poor Valer's undoing. I'll go and warn him that there's trouble brewing. Act two, or gone, Marianne. Marianne? Yes, father? A word with you. Come here. What are you looking for? Eavesdroppers, dear. I'm making sure we shan't be overheard. Someone in there could catch our every word. Ah, good. We're safe. Now, Marianne, my child, you're a sweet girl who's tractable and mild, whom I hold dear and think most highly of. I'm deeply grateful, father, for your love. That's well said, daughter. And you can repay me if in all things you cheerfully obey me. To please you, sir, is what delights me best. Good, good. Now, what do you think of Tartuffe, our guest? I, sir? Yes. Weigh your answer. Think it through. Oh, dear. Um, I'll say whatever you wish me to. That's wisely said, my daughter. Say of him then that he's the very worthiest of men and that you're fond of him and re rejoice in being his wife if that should be my choice. Well? What? What's that? I... Well? Forgive me, pray. Did you not hear me? Of whom, sir, must I say that I'm fond of him and would rejoice in being his wife, if that should be your choice? Why, of Tartuffe? But, father, that's false, you know. Why would you have me say what isn't so? Because I am resolved it shall be true, that it's my wish should be enough for you. <laughs> you can't mean Father? Yes, Tartu shall be allied by marriage to this family, and he's to be your husband. Is that clear? It's a father's privilege. Scene two, Doreen or gone, Marianne. What are you doing in here? Is curiosity so fierce a passion with you that you must eavesdrop in this fashion? So hang on, so uh, Marianne and Doreen are both being played by Marie, right? Yep. Emily, can you uh, pop in and do uh, Doreen, please? Thanks. And again, please. Good. Uh, what are you doing in here? Is curiosity so fierce a passion with you that you must eavesdrop in this fashion? There's lately been a rumor going about, based on some hunch or chance remark, no doubt, that you mean Marianne to wed Tartuffe? I've laughed it off, of course, as just a spoof. You find it so incredible. Yes, I do. I won't accept that story, even from you. Well, you'll believe it when the thing is done. Yes, yes, of course. Go on and have your fun. I've never been more serious in my life. <laughs> Daughter, I mean it. You are to be his wife. No, don't believe your father. It's all a hoax. See here, young woman. Come, sir. No more jokes. You can't fool us. How dare you talk that way? All right, then. We believe you, sad to say. But how a man like you, who looks so wise, and wears a mustache of such a splendid size, can be so foolish as to... Silence, please. My girl, you take too many liberties. I'm a master here, as you must not forget. Do let's discuss this calmly. Don't be upset. You can't be serious, sir, about this plan. What should that bigot want with Marianne? Praying and fasting ought to keep him busy. And then in terms of wealth and rank, what is he? Why should a man of property like you pick out a beggar son-in-law? That will do. Speak of his poverty with reverence. He is a pure and saintly indigence with far transcends all worldly pride and pelf. He lost his fortune, as he says himself, because he cared for heaven alone, and so was careless of his interest here below. I mean to get him out of his present straits and help him to recover his estates, which in his part of the world have no small fame. Poor though he is, he's a gentleman all the same. Yes, so he tells us. And, sir, 
It seems to me such pride goes very ill with piety. But this approach, I see, has drawn a blank. Let's speak then of his person, not his rank. Doesn't it seem to you a trifle grim to give a girl like her to a man like him? When two are too, so ill-suited, can't you see what the sad consequence is bound to be? A young girl's virtue is imperiled, sir, when such a marriage is imposed on her. For if one's bridegroom isn't to one's taste, it's hardly an inducement to be chaste, and many a man with horns upon his brow has made his wife the thing that she is now. It's hard to be a faithful wife, in short, to certain husbands of a certain sort. A father who gives his daughter to a man she hates must answer for her sins at heaven's gates. Think, sir, before you play so risky a role. This servant girl presumes to save my soul. You would do well to ponder what I've said. Daughter, we'll disregard this thunderhead. Just trust your father's judgment. Oh, I'm aware that I once promised you to young Valer, but now I hear he gambles, which greatly shocks me. What's more, I've doubts about his orthodoxy. He visits the church, I know, are very few. Would you have him go at the same hours as you and kneel nearby to be sure of being seen? I can dispense with such remarks, Doreen. Tartuffe, however, is sure of heaven's blessing, and that's the only treasure worth possessing. And she'll make him a cuckold. Just wait and see. What language? Oh, he's a man of destiny. He's made for horns and what the stars demand. Your daughter's virtue surely can't withstand. Don't interrupt me further. Why can't you learn that certain things are none of your concern? It's for your own sake that I interfere. Most kind of you. Now hold your tongue, you hear? If I didn't love you... Spare me your affection. I'll love you, sir, in spite of your objection. Blast! I can't bear, sir, for your honor's sake, to let you make this ludicrous mistake. You mean to go on talking? If I didn't protest, this sinful marriage, my conscience couldn't rest. If you don't hold your tongue, you little shrew. What, lost your temper? A pious man like you? Yes, yes, you talk and talk. I'm mad to buy it. Once and for all, I tell you to be quiet. Well, I'll be quiet, but I'll be thinking hard. Think all you like, but you had better guard that saucy tongue of yours or I'll... Now, child... I've weighed this matter fully. Drives me wild that I can't speak. Tartuffe is no young dandy, but still, his person... Is as sweet as candy. Is such that even if you shouldn't care for his other merits... They'll make a lovely pair. If I were she, no man would marry me against my inclination and go scot-free. He'd learn before the wedding day was over how readily a woman, a wife, can find a lover. It seems you treat my orders as a joke. Why, what's the matter? It was not to you I spoke. What were you doing? Talking to myself, that's all. Ah, one more bit of impudence and gall, and I shall give her a good slap in the face. Daughter, you shall accept, and with good grace, the husband I've selected, your wedding day. Why don't you talk to yourself? I have nothing to say. Come, just one word. No, thank you, sir. I'll, I pass. Come, speak. I'm waiting. I'd not be such an ass. In short, dear daughter, I mean to be obeyed, and you must bow to the sound choice I've made. I've not wed a monster, even in jest. Uh, daughter, that maid of yours is a thorough pest. She makes me sinfully annoyed and nettled. I can't speak further. My nerves are too unsettled. She's so upset me by her insolent talk. I'll calm myself for going for a walk. Good. Very good. Awesome. Doreen, Marianne. So, uh, Marie, you'll switch back to Doreen now. <laughs> <laughs> and so who will be playing Marianne? Emily's playing Marianne. Sorry, okay. I, I lost. Who, who's your main character, Emily? Uh, the wife. Almir. Okay. Yeah. So Doreen, stay Almir. with uh, Emily. <laughs> stay with Doreen and uh, Marie Marianne. Sorry. Okay. Yep. 
Well, have you lost your tongue, girl? Must I play your part and say the lines you ought to say? Faced with a fate so hideous and absurd, can you not utter one dissenting word? What good we do? A father's part is great. Resist him now, or it will be too late. But... Tell him one cannot love at a father's whim, that you shall marry for yourself, not him. That since it's you who are to be the bride, it's you, not he, who must be satisfied. And that if his tartuffe is so sublime, he's free to marry him at any time. Uh, I've bought so long to father's strict control. I, I couldn't hope on him, no, to save my soul. Come, come, Marianne. Do listen to reason, won't you? Valère has asked your hand. Do you love him or don't you? Oh, oh, unjust of you. What can you mean by asking such a question, dear Doreen? You know the depth of my affection for him. I've told you a hundred of times how oh, I adore him. I don't believe in everything I hear. Who knows if your professions were sincere? They were, Doreen, and you do me wrong to doubt it. Heaven knows that I've been all too frank about it. You love him, then? <sighs> More than I can express. And he, I take it, cares for you no law? I think so. And you both, with equal fire, bum to be married? That's all uh, one desire. That's what I thought it, would, it was supposed to be. <laughs> um, what of Tartuffe, then? What of your father's plan? I'll kill myself if I'm forced to wed that man. I hadn't thought of that recourse. How splendid! Just die and then all your troubles will be ended. A fine solution. Oh, it maddens me to hear you talk in that self-pitying key. Doreen, how harsh you are. It's most unfair. You have no sympathy for my despair. I've none at all for people who talk drivel and face with difficulties whine and snivel. No doubt I'm timid, but it could, would be wrong. True love requires a heart that's firm and strong. I'm strong in my affection for Valère, but coping with my father is his affair. But if your father's brain has grown so cracked over his dear Tartuffe that he can retract his blessing, though your wedding day was named, it's surely not Valère who's to be blamed. If I defy my father, as you suggest, would it not seem unmaidenly a best? Shall I defend my love at the expense of prisoners and disobedience? Shall I parade my heart's desires and flaunt? No, I ask nothing of you. Clearly you want to be Mrs. Tartuffe, and I feel bound not to oppose a wish so very sound. What right have I to criticize this match? Indeed, my dear, this man's a brilliant catch. Mr. Tartuffe! Now there's a man of weight. Yes, yes, Mr. Tartuffe, I'm bound to state, is quite a person. That's not to be denied. Twill be no little thing to be his bride. The world already rings with his renown. He's a great noble in his native town. His ears are red. He has a pink complexion. And all in all, he'll suit you to perfection. Dear God! Oh, how triumphant you will feel at having caught a husband so ideal. Oh, do stop teasing and use your cleverness to get me out of this appalling mess. Advise me and I will do whatever you say. Ah, no. A dutiful daughter must obey her father, even if he weds her to an ape. You've a bright future. Why struggle to escape? Your husband. Oh, you turn my blood to ice. Stop torturing me and give me your advice. Your servant, madame. Doreen, I beg you. No, you deserve it. This marriage must go through. Doreen! No. Not Tartuffe. You know I think him. 
Tartus, your cup of tea, and you shall drink him. I've always told you everything and relied. No, you deserve to be tartufified. Well, since you mock me and refuse to care, I will henceforth seek my solace in despair. Despair shall be my consoler and friend, and help me bring my sorrow to an end. There now, come back. My anger has subsided. You do deserve some pity, I've decided. The rain, if either makes me undergo this dreadful martyrdom, I'll die, I know. Don't fret. It won't be difficult to discover some plan of action. But here's Valer, your lover. Uh, Louis, play Valer, please. Louis, you still with us? Yeah. Louis? Yeah, okay. You're yeah, yeah. Right so you want an American accent? <laughs> I certainly do, son. I'll try. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's okay. That's all, yeah, it's all you can ask. Have fun with it, right? Okay, I'll, I mean, I'll try. I'm going to butcher it anyway. All right. Um, Madam, I've just received some wondrous news regarding which I'd like to hear your views. He's nailing it. What's yours? I like it. <laughs> You're marrying Tartuffe. I found that father does have such a match in mind. Your father, uh, madame. Has just this minute said that it's Tartuffe he wished me to wed. Can he be serious? Oh, indeed he can. He's clearly set his heart upon the plan. And what position do you propose to take, madame? Uh, why? I don't know. For heaven's sake, you don't know. No. Well, well. Advise me, do. Marry the man. That's my advice to you. That's your advice? Yes. Truly? Oh, absolutely. You couldn't choose more wisely, more astutely. Thanks for this counsel. I will follow it, of course. Do, do. I'm sure it will cost you no remorse. To give it didn't cause your heart to break? I gave it, madame, only for your sake. And it's for your sake that I take it, sir? Let's see which fool will prove the stubborner. So, I am nothing to you, and it was flat deception when you... Please, enough of that. I have... You have told me plainly that I should agree to wed the man my father's chosen for me. And since you have denied to counsel me so wisely, I promise, sir, to do as you advise me. Ah, no, twas not by me that you were swayed. No, your decision was already made. Though now, to save appearances, you protest that you're betraying me at my behest? Just as you say. Quite so. And now I see that you were never truly in love with me. Alas, you are free to think so, if you choose. I choose to think so. And here's a bit of news. You've spurned my hand, but I know where to turn for kind of treatment, as you shall quickly learn. I'm sure you do. Your noble qualities inspire your affections. Forget my qualities, please. They don't inspire you over much, I find. But there is another lady I have in mind, whose sweet and generous nature will not scorn to compensate me for the loss I've borne. I'm no great loss, and I'm sure that you will transfer your heart quite painlessly. You're more hurt now. You're more hurt now, not so crying inside. Okay, let the jealous monster out. Say it again. I'm no great. I'm no great loss, and I'm sure you would transfer your heart quite endlessly from me to her. I'll do my best to take it in my stride. The pain I feel at being cast aside, time and forgetfulness may put an end to. Or if I can't forget, I shall pretend to. No self-respecting person is expected to go on loving once he's been rejected. No, that's a fine, high-minded sentiment. One to which any sane man would assent. Would you prefer if I 
pined away in hopeless passion till my dying day. Go then, console yourself, don't hesitate. I wish you to, indeed, I cannot wait. You wish me to? Yes. That's the final straw. Madam, farewell. Your wish shall be my law. <laughs> Splendid. This breach, remember, is of your making. It's you who've driven me to the step I'm taking. Of course. Remember, too, that I am merely following your example. I see that clearly. Enough. I'll go and do your bidding, then. Good. You shall never see my face again. Excellent. Yes? <laughs> what? What's that? Uh, what did you say? Nothing. You, you are dreaming. Ah. Uh, well, I'm on my way. Farewell, madame. Farewell. If you ask me, both of you are as mad as mad can be. Do stop this nonsense now. I've only let you squabble so long to see where it would get you. Whoa there, dearest Valère. What's this, Doreen? Come here. No, no, my heart's too full of spleen. Don't hold me back. Her wish must be obeyed. Stop! It's too late now. My decision's made. Oh, poo. He hates the sign of me. That's plain. I would go and so deliver him from, deliver him from pain. And now you run away? Come back. No, no. Nothing you will say. Keep me here. Let go. She cannot bear my presence, I perceive. To spare her further torment, I shall leave. Again, you'll not escape, sir. Don't you try it. Come here, you two. Stop fussing and be quiet. What do you want of me? What's the point of this? We're going to have a little armistice. Now, weren't you silly to get so overheated? Didn't you see how badly I was treated? Aren't you a simpleton to have lost your head? Didn't you hear the hateful things he said? You're both great fools. Her sole desire, Valère, is to be yours in marriage. To that, I'll swear. He loves you only, and he wants no wife but you, Marianne. On that, I'll stake my life. Then why you advise me so? I cannot see. On such a question, why ask advice of me? Oh, you're impossible. Give me your hands, you two. Yours first. But why? And now a hand from you. What are you doing? Fair, a perfect fit. You suit each other better than you'll admit. Ah, uh, come, don't be so haughty. Give a man a look of kindness, won't you, Marianne? I tell you, lovers are completely mad. Now come, confess that you were very bad to hurt my feelings as you did just now. I have a just complaint you must allow. You must allow that you are most unpleasant. Let's table that discussion for the present. Your father has a plan which must be stopped. Advise us then, what means must we adopt? We'll use all manners of means and all at once. Your father's adult. He's acting like a dunce. Therefore, you'd, be, you'd better humor the old fossil. Pretend to yield to him. Be sweet and docile, and then postpone, as often as necessary, the day on which you have agreed to marry. You'll thus gain time, and time will turn the trick. Sometimes, for instance, you'll be taken sick, and that will seem a good reason for delay. Or some bad omen will make you change the day. You'll dream of muddy water, or you'll pass a dead man's hearse, or break a looking glass. If all else fails, no man can marry you unless you take his ring and say, I do. But now, let's separate. If they should find us talking here, our plot might be divined. Go to your friends and tell them what's occurred, and have them urge her father to keep his word. Meanwhile, we'll stir her brother into action, and get Elmir as well to join our faction. Goodbye. Though each of us will do his best, it's true your heart on which my hopes shall rest. 
regardless of what father may decide, none but valor shall claim me as his bride. Oh, how those words content me. Come what will. Oh, lovers, lovers, their tongues are never still. Be off now. One last word. No time to chat. You leave by this door, and you leave by that. Okay, good. The Mercutial accent. <laughs> There's so much comedy in that last part of that scene. It's really funny. You can just picture all the comings and goings. Yeah, and then the two of them back to back. And uh, I, I'm seeing, I'm really starting to see Doreen clearly. Yeah, she's a great character. Yeah, it's wonderful. You guys want to take a five minute break before we tr tackle Act Three? Or you want to keep going? Okay. Fine, keep going or either one. Keep going, let's keep going, it's going great. Okay, uh, Demi and Doreen. So uh, I don't wanna, who, who's sitting there quietly for too long now? Ah, oh, Kaylin. Hi, we'll that's Demi, me. Okay. Okay, what am I going for? Uh, Demi's the hothead, right? Okay. Yeah, he's, uh, and he really hates Tartuffe. Okay. Okay. It's a man, so. Yeah, I can do, do that. Go for it. <laughs> may lightning strike me even as I speak. May all men call me cowardly and weak. If any fear or scruple holds me back from setting things at once with that great quack. Now, don't give way to violent emotion. Your fathers merely talked about this notion. And words and deeds are far from being one. Much that is talked about is left undone. No. I must stop that scoundrel's machinations. I'll go and tell him off. I'm out of patience. Do calm down and be practical. I had rather my mistress dealt with him and with your father. She has some influence with Tartuffe, I've noticed. He hangs upon her words, seems to be most devoted, and may indeed be smitten by her charm. Pray heaven, it's true. T'would do our cause no harm. She sent for him just now to sound him out on this affair you're so incensed about. She'll find out where he stands, and tell him, too, what dreadful strife and trouble will ensue if he leads countenance to your father's plan. I couldn't get in to see him, but his man says he's almost finished with his prayers. Go now. I'll catch him when he comes downstairs. I want to hear this conference, and I will. No, they must be alone. Oh, I'll keep still. Not you. I know your temper. You'll start a brawl and shout and stamp your foot and spoil it all. Go on. I won't. I have a perfect right. Lord, you're a nuisance. He's coming. Get out of sight. Okay, here we go. We're going to meet Tartuffe. Um, Kaylin, hmm? let's hear your Donald Trump. I don't have a Donald Trump. You're going to now. God, my sister has a Donald Trump. Start I don't have a Donald Trump. Start develop. Just do what you can with it, okay? It is Donald Trump. Okay, so let's... <laughs> Do what you can with it. We're we're all picturing Donald Trump in our in our minds. Oh God, I cannot do a Donald Trump. Okay. <laughs> Hang up my hair shirt, put my scourge in place, and pray, Lauren, for heaven's sake, perpetual grace. I'm going to the prison now to share my last few coins with the poor wretches there. Dear God, what affectation! What a fake! You wish to see me? Yes. For mercy's sake, please take this handkerchief before you speak. What? Cover that bosom, girl. The flesh is weak, and unclean thoughts are difficult to control. Such sights as that can undermine the soul. Your soul, it seems, has very poor defenses, and flesh makes quite an impact on your senses. It's strange that you're so easily excited. My own desires are not so soon ignited. And if I, f if I saw you naked as a beast, not all your hide would tempt me in the least. Girl, speak more modestly. Unless you do, I shall be forced to take my leave of you. Oh, no, it's just I who must be on my way. I have just one little message to convey. Madame is coming down and begs you, sir, to wait and have a word or two with her. Gladly. That has a softening effect. I think my guess about him was correct. Will she be long? No, that's her step, I hear. Ah, uh, here she is, and I will disappear. Okay, so Tartuffe 
you lust after Elmir, right? Okay. Okay. Ugh. Here we go. Gross. May heaven, whose infinite goodness we adore, preserve your body and soul forevermore, and bless your days and answer thus the plea of one who is its humblest votary. I thank you for that pious wish. But please, do take a chair and let's be more at ease. I trust that you are once more well and strong. Oh, yes. The fever didn't last for long. My prayers are too unworthy. I am sure to have gained from heaven this most gracious cure. But lately, madame, my every supplication has had for object recuperation. You shouldn't have troubled so. I don't deserve it. Your health is priceless, madame, and to preserve it, I gladly give you my own in all sincerity. Sir, you outdo us all in Christian charity. You've been most kind. I count myself your debtor. Twas nothing, madame. I long to serve you better. There's a private matter I'm anxious to discuss. I'm glad there's no one here to hinder us. I too am glad. It floods my heart with bliss to find myself alone with you like this. For just this chance I've prayed with all my power, but prayed in vain until this happy hour. This won't take long, sir, and I hope you'll be entirely frank and unconstrained with me. Indeed, there's nothing I'd rather do than bear my, most in, my, my inmost heart and soul to you. First, let me say that what remarks I've made about the constant visits you are paid were prompted not by any mean emotion, but rather by a pure and deep devotion, a fervent zeal. No need for explanation. Your sole concern, I'm sure, was my salvation. Quite so, and such a great fervor I do feel. Ooh, please, you're pinching. Twas from excess zeal. I never meant to cause you pain, I swear. I'd rather... What can your hand be doing there? Feeling your gown, what soft five-woven stuff. Please, I'm extremely ticklish. That's enough. My, my, what lovely lace work on your dress. The worksmanship's miraculous, no less. I've not seen anything equal to it. Yes, quite. But let's talk business for a bit. They say my husband means to break his word and give his daughter to you, sir. Had you heard? He did once mention it, but I confess, I dream of quite a different happiness. It's elsewhere, madame, that my eyes discern the promise of that bliss for which I yearn. I see. You care for nothing here below. Ah, well, my heart's not made of stone, you know. <laughs> all your desires mount heavenward, I'm sure, in scorn of all that's earthly and impure. A love of heavenly beauty does not preclude a proper love for earthly I can't pronounce that. Pulchritude. Pulchritude. <laughs> our senses are quite rightly captivated by perfect works our maker has created. Some glory clings to all that heaven has made. In you, all heaven's marvels are displayed. On that fair face, such beauties have been lavished. The eyes are dazzled and the hearts ravished. How could I look on you, O oh flawless creature, and not adore the author of all nature, feeling a love both passionate and pure, for you his triumph of self-portraiture. It is, I know, presumptuous on my part to bring you this poor offering of my heart, and it is not my merit, heaven knows, but your compassion on which my hopes repose. You are my peace, my solace, my salvation. On you depends my bliss or desolation. I abide your judgment, and as you think best, I shall be either miserable or blessed." Your declaration is most gallant, sir, but don't you think it's out of character? You've done better to restrain your passion and think before you spoke in such a fashion. It ill becomes a pious man like you. I may be pious, but I'm human too. Mm -hmm. With your celestial charms before his eyes, a man has not the power to be wise. I know such words sound strangely coming from me, but I'm no angel, nor was meant to be. And if you blame my passion, you must, your, you must needs and reproach as well the charm on which it feeds. Your loveliness I had no sooner seen than you became my soul's unrivaled queen. If, in compassion for my soul's distress, you stoop to comfort my unworthiness, I shall raise you, and thanks for that sweet manna, a he an endless hymn, an infinite hasana, 
with me, of course, there be no there need be no anxiety, no fear of scandal or of notoriety. These young court gallants, whom all the ladies fancy, are vain in speech, in action rash and chancy. When they succeed in love, the world soon knows it. No favors granted to them, but they disclose it. And by the looseness of their tongues profane the very altar where their hearts have lain, men of my sort, however, however love discreetly, and one may trust our reticence completely. My keen concern for my good name ensures the absolute security of yours. In short, I offer you, my dear Elmir, love without scandal, pleasure without fear. I've heard your well-turned speeches to the end, and what you urge I clearly apprehend. Aren't you afraid I may take a notion to tell my husband of your warm devotion, and that, supposing he were duly told, his feelings toward you might grow rather cold? I know, dear lady, that your exceeding charity will lead your heart to pardon my temerity, that you'll excuse my violent affection, and as human weakness, human imperfection, and that, O oh, fairest, you will bear in mind that I'm but flesh and blood and am not blind. Some women might do otherwise, perhaps, but I shall be discreet about your lapse. I'll tell my husband nothing of what's occurred, if, in return, you'll give your solemn word to advocate as forcefully as you can the marriage of Valer and Marianne, renouncing all desire to dispossess another of his rightful happiness, and... Yeah, me. That's me. No, we'll not hush up this vile affair. I heard it all inside that closet there, where heaven, in order to confound the pride of this great rascal, prompted me to hide, and now, ah, uh, now, oh, Jesus, ah, uh, now I have my long-awaited chance to punish his deceit and arrogance, and give my father clear and shocking proof of this black character of his dear Tartuffe. Ah, uh, no, Demi, I'll be content if he will study to deserve my leniency. I've promised silence. Don't break me, no, don't make me break my word. To make a scandal would be too absurd. Good wives laugh off such trifles and forget them. Why should they tell their husbands and upset them? You have your reasons for taking such a course, and I have reasons too of equal force. To spare him now would be insanely wrong. I've swallowed my just wrath for far too long and watched this insolent bigot bringing strife and bitterness to our family's life. Too long he's meddled in my father's affairs, thwarting my marriage hopes and poor Valère's. It's high time that my father was undeceived, and now I've proof that can't be disbelieved. Proof that was furnished me by heaven above, it's too good not to take advantage of. This is my chance, and I deserve to lose it, if for one minute I hesitate to use it. To me. No, I must do what I think right. Madam, my heart is bursting with delight. I say whatever you will, I'll not consent. And say whatever you will, I'll not consent to lose the sweet revenge on which I'm bent. I'll settle matters without more ado, and here most opportunely is my cue. Father. I'm so glad you've joined us. Let us advise you of some fresh news with which doubtless will surprise you. You've just now been repaid with interest for all your loving kindness to our guest. He's proved his warm and grateful feelings toward you. It's a pair of horns he would reward. It's with a pair of horns he would reward you. Yes, I surprised him with your wife and heard his whole adulterous offer, every word. She, with her all too gentle disposition, would have told you of his proposition, but I shall not make terms with brazen lechery and feel that not to tell you would be treachery. Jeez. And I hold that one's husband's peace of mind should not be spo spoilt by tattle of this kind. These are my sentiments, and I wish to me that you had heeded me and held your peace. Can this be true, this dreadful thing I hear? Yes, brother. I'm a wicked man, I fear. A wretched sinner, all depraved and twisted. The greatest villain that has ever existed. 
my life's one heap of crimes, which grows each minute, there's naught but foulness and corruption in it, and I perceive that heaven, outraged by me, has chosen this occasion to mortify me. Charge me with any deed you wish to name, I'll not defend myself, but take the blame. Believe what you are told, and drive Tarfoot Tooth like some base criminal from beneath your roof. Yes, drive me hence, and with a parting curse, I shan't protest, for I deserve far worse. Oh, you deceitful boy. How dare you try to stain his purity with so foul a lie. What? Are you taken in by such a bluff? Did you not hear? Enough, you rogue. Enough. Ah. Uh, Brother, let him speak. You're being unjust. Believe his story. The boy deserves your trust. Why, after all, should you have faith in me? How can you not know what I might do or be? Is it on my good actions that you base your favor? Do you trust my pious face? Ah, no. Don't be deceived by hollow shows. I'm far, alas, from being what men suppose. Though the world takes me for a man of worth, I'm truly the most worthless man on earth. Yes, my dear son, speak out now. Call me the chief of sinners, a wretch, a murderer, a thief. Load me with all the names most, most men, up, men most abhor. I'll not complain, I've earned them all and more. I'll kneel here while you pour them on my head as a, a just punishment for the life I've led. This is too much, dear brother. Have you no heart? Are you so hoodwinked by this rascal's art? Be still, you monster. Brother, I pray you rise, villain. What? Silence. Can't you realize? Just one word more and I'll tear you limb from limb. In God's name, brother, don't be harsh with him. I'd rather be far, to I'd rather be far be tortured at the stake than see him bear one more scratch up for my poor sake. Ingrate. If I must beg you on bended knee to pardon him. Such goodness cannot be. Now there's true charity. What? You. Villain, be still. You know your motives. I know you wish him ill. Yes, all of you, wife, children, servants, all conspire against him and desire his fall, employing every shameful trick you can to alienate me from this saintly man. Ah, but the more you seek to drive him away, the more I'll do to keep him. Without delay, I'll spite this household and confound its pride by giving him my daughter as his bride. You're going to force her to accept his hand. Yes, and this very night. Do you understand? I shall defy you all and make it clear that I'm the one who gives the orders here. Come, wretch, kneel down and clasp his blessed feet and ask his pardon for your black deceit. I ask that swindler's pardon? Why, I'd rather... So... You insult him and defy your father? A stick, a stick. No, no, release me, do. Out of my house this minute. Be off with you and never set foot in it again. Well, I shall go, but... Well, go quickly then. I disinherit you. An empty purse is all you'll get from me, except my curse. How he blasphemed your good name. What a son. Forgive him, Lord, as I've already done. You can't know how it hurts when someone tries to blacken me in my dear brother's eyes. Ah. The mere thought of such ingratitude plunges my soul into so dark a mood. Such horror grips my heart, I gasp for breath, and cannot speak and feel myself near death. You blackguard! Why did I spare you? Why did I not break you in little pieces on the spot? Compose yourself and don't be hurt, dear friend. These scenes, these dreadful quarrels have got to end. I've much upset your household, and I perceive that the best thing will be for me to leave. What are you saying? They're all against me here. They'd have you think me false and insincere. Ah, what of that? Have I ceased believing in you? Their adverse talk will certainly continue, and charges which you now repudiate you may find credible at a later date. No, brother, never. Brother, a wife can sway her husband's mind in many a subtle, subtle way. No, no, no. To leave at once is the solution. Thus only can I end their persecution. No, no, I'll not allow it. You shall remain. Ah, well, it will mean much martyrdom and pain, but if you wish it. Ah. Enough. So be it. But one thing must be settled as I see it. 
For your dear honor and for our friendship's sake, there's one precaution I feel bound to take. I shall avoid your wife and keep away. No, you shall not, whatever they may say. It pleases me to vex them, and for spite I'd have them see you with her day and night. What's more, I'm going to drive them to despair by making you my only son and heir. This very day I'll give to you alone clear deed and title to everything I own. A dear good friend and son-in-law to be is more than wife or child or kin to me. Will you accept my offer, dearest son? In all things, let the will of heaven be done. Poor fellow, come, we'll go draw up the deed. Then let them burst with disappointed greed. Whoa, pretty greasy stuff, huh? I do not have that low a voice. Oh my God. <laughs> okay, I mean, we, just as we're, we just need to hear the words coming out knowing that it's Trump. You, just reading it clearly is <laughs> fine. We know that it, it's Trump saying it. We know it's it's America giving Trump the house, right? So, this is my take on the way that Trump talks is that when he says very serious, when he talks about very serious and important things, he says it without any emotion. And when he talks about trivial, stupid, meaningless things, he like rack, ramps up the emotion as much as he can. It's a very strange kind of strange to watch him speak. Because yeah, he it, doesn't understand the big stuff. So he's just yes, kind of reading yes, a card. Yes, exactly. What I'm getting from this is Trump would never have this kind of vocabulary. Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> it's really unnatural. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Cleant. Hey, uh, young Louis. I, I'm sure Laurent will show up sooner or later, but why don't you do Cleant this time? Uh, hey, Louis, you want to try your Trump? Uh... <laughs> Just have fun. Mean, okay. Yeah, you do. You do time, uh, time. and uh, and uh, hey, Marie, we haven't heard from you for a while. Okay, so you want me to do Cleant? Cleant, yeah. Who is Cleant actually? No, oh, I have to go back to the top. Right, come on. Brother-in-law of Orgon. So Elmira's brother. Yeah. Voice of reason and calm. Okay. What page are we on, please? Uh, it's 53. Thank you. Yeah, find it back. Yes, all the time discussing it, and truly, their comments do not flatter you unduly. I'm glad we have met, sir, and I will give you my view of this sad matter in a word or two. Uh, as for who's guilty, that I shan't discuss. Let's say um, it was Dami who caused the fuss. Assuming then that you have been ill-used by young Dami and groundlessly accused, ought not a Christian to forgive and ought he not to trifle every vengeful thought? Alas, for my part, I should take great joy. In doing so, I have nothing against the boy. I pardon all, I harbor no resentment. To serve him would afford me much contentment. But heaven's interest will not have it so. If he comes back, then I shall have to go. Uh, after his conduct so extreme, so vicious, our further intercourse would look suspicious. God knows what people would think, why they describe my goodness to him as sort of a bribe. Your reasoning is badly wrapped and stretched. And these excuses, sir, are most far-fetched. Why put yourself in charge of heaven's cause? Does heaven need your help to enforce its laws? Leave vengeance to the Lord, sir, while we leave our duties not to punish, but forgive. Again, let me say that I've forgiven Demi and thus obeyed the laws of heaven. But I am not commanded by the Bible to live with one who smears my name with libel. Were you command, sir, to indulge the whim of poor Argon and to encourage him in suddenly transferring to your name a large estate to which you have no claim? It would never occur to those who know me best to think I acted from self-interest. The treasures of this world I quite despise. Their spacious glitter does not charm my eyes, 
if I resign myself to taking the gift which my dear brother insists on making, I do so only as well as he understands, lest so much wealth fall onto wicked hands, lest those to whom it might descend in time turn it to purposes of sin and crime, and not, as I shall do, make use of it for heaven's glory and mankind's benefit. Forget these trumpets, <laughs> trumped up fears. Your argument is one the rightful heir might well resent. It is a moral burden to inherit such wealth, but give Dami a chance to bear it. Would it not be the decent things to beat a generous and honorable retreat rather than let the son of the house be sent for your convenience into banishment? Sir, if you wish to prove you the honesty of your intentions. Sir, it is half past three. I've searched in pious duties to attend to and hope my prompt departure won't offend you. Damn. Okay, Elmir is uh, Emily. There is only Doreen speaking in this. Oh, okay. Just, yeah, go for it then. Me? Yeah. Stay, sir, and help Marianne, for heaven's sake. She's suffering so. I fear her heart will break. A father's plan to marry her off tonight has put the poor child in a desperate plight. I hear him coming. Let's stand together now and see if we can change his mind somehow about this match we all deplore and fear. Okay, so Orgon is uh, Jamie, Elmir is uh, uh, Emily, Marianne is going to be Marie, Cleant is Louis, and Doreen is Kaylin. Ah, glad to find you all assembled here. This contract child contains your happiness and what it says I think your heart can guess. Sir, by that heaven which sees me here distressed and by whatever else can move your breast, do not employ a father's power, I pray you to crush my heart and force it to obey you, nor by your harsh comments oppress me so. I will begrudge the duty which I owe, and do not so embitter and enslave me, that I shall hate you, the very life you gave me. If my sweet hopes must perish, if you refuse to give me to the one I've dared to choose, Spare me at least, I beg you, I implore the pain of wedding one who I abhor, and do not by a heartless use of force drive me to contemplate some desperate course. Be firm, my soul, no human weakness now. I don't resent your love for him, allow your heart free reign, sir. Give him your property, and if that's not enough, take mine from me. He's welcome to my money. Take it, do, but don't, I pray, include my person too. Spare me, I beg you, and let me end the tale of my sad days behind the, a convent veil. The convent? Ha! <laughs> When crossed, and there are more, all lovesick girls have the same thought as yours. Get up. The more you loathe the man and dread him, the more ennobling it will be to wed him. Marry Tartuffe and mortify your flesh. Enough. Don't start that whimpering afresh. But why? Be still there. Speak when you're spoken to. Not one more bit of impudence out of you. If, if I may offer a word of counsel here, Brother, in counseling, you have no peer. All your advice is forceful, sound, and clever. I don't propose to follow it, however. I am amazed and don't know what to say. Your blindness simply takes my breath away. 
You are indeed bewitched to take no warning from our account of what occurred this morning. Madam, I know a few plain facts, and one is that you're partial to my rascal son. Hence, when he sought to make Tartuffe the victim of a base lie, you dared not contradict him. Ah, but you underplayed your part, my pet. You should have looked more angry, more upset. When men make overtures, must we reply with righteous anger and a battle cry? Must we turn our back, must we turn back their amorous advances with sharp reproaches and with fiery glances? Myself, I find no offenses, I find such offenses merely amusing and make no scenes and fusses in refusing. I have found that a polite and cool rebuff discourages a lover quite enough. I know the facts and I will not be shaken. I marvel at your power to be mistaken. Would it, I wonder, carry weight with you if I could show you that our tale was true? Show me? Yes. Rot. Come, what if I found a way to make you see the facts as plain as day? Nonsense. Do answer me, don't be absurd. I'm not now asking you to trust our word, Suppose that, some from, that from some hiding place in here, you learned the whole sad truth by ear and by eye and ear. What would you say of your good friend after that? Why, I'd say nothing by Jehoshaphat. It can't be true. You've been too long deceived, and I'm quite tired of being disbelieved. Come now, let's put my statement to the test, and you shall see the truth made manifest. I'll take that challenge. I'll do your uttermost. We'll see how you make good your empty boast. Send him to me. He's crafty. It may be hard to catch the cunning scoundrel off his guard. No, amorous men are gullible. Their conceit so blinds them that they're never hard to cheat. Have him come down. Please leave us for a bit. Put up this table and get under it. What? It's essential that you be well hidden. Why there? Oh, heavens, just do as you are bidden. I have my plans. We'll soon see how they fare. Under the table now, and once you're there, take care that you are neither seen nor heard. Well, I'll indulge you since I gave my word to see you through this infantile charade. Once it is over, you'll be glad we played. I'm going to act quite strangely now, and you must not be shocked at anything I do. Whatever I may say, you must excuse as a part of that deceit. I'm forced to use. I shall employ sweet speeches in the task of making that imposter drop his mask. I'll give encouragement to his bold desires and furnish fuel to his amorous fires. Since it's for your sake and for his destruction that I shall seem to yield to his seduction, I'll gladly stop whenever you decide that all your doubts are fully satisfied. I'll count on you as soon as you have seen what sort of man he is to intervene and not expose me to his odious lust one moment longer than you feel you must. Remember, you're to save me from my plight whenever he's coming. Hush, keep out of sight. Uh, Lewis. Yeah. Tartuffe. Trump. Okay. Up here, right? Page 59. Yeah, I was ahead. Sorry, I was waiting for... All right. You wish to have a word with me, I'm told. Yes, I have a little secret to unfold. Before we speak, however, it would be wise to close that door and look about for spies. The very last thing that must happen now is a repetition of this morning's row. I've never been so badly caught off guard. Oh, how I feared for you. You saw how hard I tried to make that troublesome to me control his dreadful temper and hold his peace. In my confusion, I didn't have the sense simply to contradict his evidence. But as it happens, that was for the best and has all worked out in our interest. This storm has only bettered your position. My husband doesn't have the least suspicion. And now, in mockery of those who do, he bids me to be continually with you. And that is why, quite fearless of reproof, I can now be alone with my tartuffe 
and why my heart, perhaps too quick to yield, feels free to let its passion be revealed. Okay. Yeah. Madam, your words confuse me. Not long ago, you spoke in quite a different style, you know. Ah, sir, if that refusal made you smart, it's little that you know of woman's heart or what that heart is trying to convey when it resists in such a feeble way. Always, at first, our modesty prevents the frank avowal of tender sentiments. However high the passion which inflames us, still, to confess its power somehow shames us. Thus, we relax at first, yet in a tone which tells you that our heart is overthrown, that what our lips deny, our pulse confesses, and that in time all no's will turn to yeses. I fear my words are all too frank and free, and a poor proof of a woman's modesty. But since I'm started, tell me, if you will, would I have tried to make Demi be still? Would I have listened, calm and unoffended, until your lengthy offer of love was ended, and have been so very mild in my reaction? Had your sweet words not given me satisfaction? And when I tried to force you to undo the marriage plans my husband has in view, what did my urgent pleading signify, if not that I admired you, and that I deplored the thought that someone else might own part of a heart I wished for mine alone? Mad Madam, no happiness is so complete as when from lips we love come words so sweet. Their nectar floods my every scent and drains in hun hun yard honeyed honey rivulets through all my veins. To please you is my joy, my only goal. To love is the restorer of my soul. And yet I must beg leave now to confess some lingering doubts as to my happiness. Might this not be a trick? Might not the catch be that you wish me to break off the match with Marianne and so have feigned to love me? I shan't quite trust your fond opinion of me until the feelings you've expressed so sweetly are demonstrated somewhat more concretely. And you have shown by certain kind concessions that I may put my faith in your possessions. <clears throat> Why be in such a hurry? Must my heart exhaust its bounty at the very start? To make that sweet admission cost me dear, but you'll not be content, it appears, unless my store of favors is dispersed to the last farthing and at the very first. The less we merit, the less we dare to hope, and with our doubts, mere words can never cope. We trust no promised bliss till we receive it, not till a joy is ours can we believe it. I, host who so little merit your esteem, can't credit this fulfillment of my dream, and shan't believe it, madam, until I savor some palpable assurance of your favor. My, how tyrannical your love can be, and how it flusters and perplexes me, how furiously you take one's heart in hand and make your every wish a fierce command. Come, you must ha must you hound and harry me to death? Will you not give me time to catch my breath? Can it be right to press me with such force? Give me no quarter, show me no remorse, and take advantage by your stern insistence of the fond feelings which weaken my resistance. Well, if you look with favor upon my love, why then begrudge me some clear proof thereof? How can I consent without offense to heaven, toward which you feel such reverence? If heaven is all that holds you back, don't worry. I can remove the hindrance in a hurry. Nothing of that sort need obstruct our path. Must one not be afraid of heaven's wrath? Madam, forget such fears and be my pupil, and I shall teach you how to conquer scruple. Some joys, it's true, are wrong in heaven's eyes, yet heaven is not averse to compromise. There is a science lately formulated, whereby one's conscience may be liberated, and any wrongful act you care to mention may be redeemed by purity of intention. I'll teach you, madame, the secrets of that science. Meanwhile, just place on me your full reliance. Asu, asu, asuage my keen desires and feel no dread. The sin, if any, shall be on my head. Oh. <laughs> You've a bad cough. <laughs> yes. It's bad indeed. <laughs> a bit of licorice may be what you need. No, I've a stubborn cold, it seems. 
I'm sure it will take much more than a <coughs> licorice to cure it. How aggravating. <coughs> oh, more than I can say. If you are still troubled, think of things this way. No one shall know our joys. Save us alone. And there is no evil till the act is known. It's scandal, madam, which makes it an offense. And it's no sin to sin in confidence. <clears throat> well, clearly I must do as you require and yield to your importune desire. It is apparent now that nothing less will satisfy you. And so I acquiesce to go so as far is much against my will. I'm vexed that it should come to this. But still, since you are so determined on it, since you will not allow mere language to convince you, and since you have asked, since you ask for concrete evidence, I see nothing for it, but now to comply. If this is sinful, if I'm wrong to do it, so much the worse for him who drove me to it, the fault can surely not be charged to me. Madam, the fault is mine, if fault there be, and... Open the door a little more and peek out, I wouldn't want my husband poking about. Why worry about the man? Each day he grows more gullible, one can lead him by the nose. To find us here would fill him with delight, and if he saw the worst, he'd doubt his sight. Nevertheless, do step outside for a minute into the hall and see that no one's in it. That man's a perfect monster, I must admit. I'm simply stunned. I can't get over it. What? Coming out so soon? How premature. Get back in hiding and wait until you're sure. Stay until the end and be convinced completely. We mustn't stop till things are proved concretely. Hell never harbored anything so vicious. Tut, don't be hasty. Try to be judicious. Wait and be certain there's no mistake. No jumping to conclusions, for heaven's sake. Madam, all things have worked out to perfection. I've given the neighboring rooms a full inspection. No one's about. And now I may at last. Hold on, my passionate fellow. Not so fast. I should advise a little more restraint. Well, so you thought you'd fool me, my dear saint. How soon you wearied of the saintly life, wedding my daughter and coveting my wife. I long suspected you and had a feeling that soon I'd catch you at your double dealing. Just now you've given me evidence galore. It's quite enough. I have no wish for more. I'm sorry to have treated you so slyly, but circumstances forced me to be wily. Brother, you can't think. No more talk from you. Just leave this household without more ado. What I intended. That seems fairly clear. Spare me your falsehoods and get out of here. No. I'm the master and you're the one to go. This house belongs to me, I'll have you know. And I shall show you that you can't hurt me by this contemptible conspiracy. That those who cross me know not what they do. And that I have means to expose and punish you. Avenge offended heaven and make you grieve that ever you dared order me to leave. What was the point of all that angry chatter? Dear God, I'm worried. This is no laughing matter. How so? I fear I understood his drift. I'm much disturbed about that deed of gift. You gave him... Yes, it's all been drawn and signed, but one thing more is weighing on my mind. What's that? I'll tell you, but first let's see if there's a certain strong box in his room upstairs. Keep going. <laughs> uh, Cleant, uh, Kalen, can you do Cleant, please? Where are you going so fast? God knows. Then wait. Let's have a conference and deliberate on how this situation's to be met. That strong box has me utterly upset. This is the worst of many, many shocks. Is there some fearful mystery in that box? My poor friend Argus brought that box to me with his own hands in utmost secrecy. It was on the very morning of his flight. It's full of papers which, if they came to light, would ruin him, or such is my impression. Then why did you let it out of your possession? Those papers vexed my conscience, and it seemed best to ask the counsel of my pious guest. The cunning scoundrel got me to agree to leave the strong box in his custody so that, in case of an investigation, I could employ a slight equivocation 
and swear I didn't have it, and thereby at no expense to conscience tell a lie. It looks to me as if you're out on a limb. Trusting him with that box and offering him the deed of that deed of gift were actions of a kind which scarcely indicate a prudent mind. With two such weapons, he has the upper hand, and since you're vulnerable, as matters stand, you erred once more in bringing him to bay. You should have acted in some subtler way. Just think of it. Behind that fervent face, heart so wicked, and a soul so base. I took him in, a hungry beggar, and then... Enough by God. I'm through with pious men. Henceforth, I'll hate the whole false brotherhood and persecute them worse than Satan could. Ah, there you go, extravagant as ever. Why can you not be rational? You never manage to take the middle course, it seems, but jump instead between absurd extremes. You've recognized your recent grave mistake in falling victim to a pious fake. Now, to correct that error, must you embrace an even greater error in its place and judge our worthy neighbors as a whole by what you've learned of one corrupted soul? Be cautious in bestowing admiration and cultivate a sober moderation. Don't humor fraud, but also don't asperse true piety. The latter fault is worse, and it is best to err, if err one must, as you have done upon the side of trust. Uh, Demi the son. Lewis. The hot-headed yeah. son. All right. Father, I hear that scoundrels utter threats against you that he pridefully would forget. It's true, my boy. I'm too distressed for tears. Leave it to me, sir. Let me trim his ears. Faced with such insolence, we must not waver. I shall rejoice in doing you the favor of cutting short his life and your distress. What a display of young hot-headedness. Do learn to moderate your fits of rage. In this just country, this enlightened age, one does not settle things by violence. Okay, you're back to Madame Purnell, okay? Uh, Caleb? Yes. Marianne is going to be Marie. Elmir is going to be Emily. Shit, there's too many people in this. <laughs> uh, Emily, you're going to do double duty with Elmir and Doreen. Okay. Okay. Louis, you stay with Demi, Jamie with Orgon, and I'll, I'll read Cleant. I hear got strange, it. okay, right? We got it? Yeah. Okay, away we go. I hear strange tales of very strange events. Yes, strange events which these two eyes beheld. The man's ingratitude is unparalleled. I save a wretched pauper from starvation, house him and treat him like a blood relation, shower him every day with my largesse, give him my daughter and all that I possess. And meanwhile, the unconscionable knave tries to induce my wife to misbehave and not content with such extreme rascality now threatens me with my own liberality and aims by taking base advantage of the gifts I gave him out of Christian love to drive me from my house, a ruined man and make me in the pauper as he began. Poor fellow. No, my son, I'll never bring myself to think him guilty of such a thing. How's that? The righteous old ways were maligned. Speak clearly, mother. Say what's on your mind. I mean that I can smell a rat, my dear. You know how everybody hates him here. That has no bearing on this case at all. I told you a hundred times when you were small that virtue in this world is hated ever. Malicious men may die, but malice never. No doubt that's true, but how does it apply? They've turned you against him by a clever lie. I've told you I was there and saw it done. Ah, slanderers will stop at nothing, son. Mother, I'll lose my temper. For the last time, I tell you I was witness to the crime. The tongues of spite are busy night and noon, and to their venom no man is immune. You're talking nonsense. Can't you realize I saw it? Saw it? Saw it with my eyes? Saul, do you understand me? Must I shout it into your ears before you'll cease to doubt me? Appearances can deceive, my son. Dear me, we cannot always judge by what we see. Dret, dret. One often interprets things awry. Good can seem evil to a suspicious eye. Was I to see his pawing at Elmir as an act of charity? 
Till his guilt is clear, a man deserves the benefit of the doubt. You should have waited to see how things turned ah. out. Great God in heaven, what more proof did I need? Was I to sit there watching until he... You drive me to the brink of impropriety. No, no, a man of such surpassing piety could do, not do such a thing. You cannot shake me. I don't believe, and you shall not make me. You vex me so that if you weren't my mother, I'd say to you some dreadful thing or other. It's your turn now, sir, not to be listened to. You not trust us, and now she won't trust you. My friends, we're wasting time, which should be spent in facing up to our predicament. I fear that scoundrel's threats weren't made in sport. Hot-headed son. Did we lose him? Apologies. No, Apologies. Do you think he'd have the nerve to go to court? I'm sure he won't. They'd find it all too crude, a case of swindling and ingratitude. But don't be too sure. He won't be at a loss to give his claims a high and righteous gloss. And clever rogues with far less valid cause have trapped their victims in a web of laws. I say again that to antagonize a man so strongly armed was most unwise. I know it, but the man's appalling cheek outraged me so I couldn't control my peak. I wish to heaven that we could devise some truce between you some, or, or some compromise. If I had known what cards he'd held, I'd not have roused his anger by my little plot. What is that fellow looking for? Who is he? Go talk to him and tell him that I'm busy. Uh, good day, dear sister. Kindly let me see your master. He's involved with company and cannot be disturbed just now, I fear. I hate to intrude, but what has brought me here will not disturb your master in any event. Indeed, my news will make him most content. Your name? Just say that I bring greetings from Monsieur Tartuffe, uh, on whose behalf I've come. Sir, he's a very gracious man and bears a message from Tartuffe, which he declares will make you most content. Upon my word, I think this man had best be seen and heard. Perhaps he has some settlement to suggest. How shall I treat him? What manner would be best? I control your anger. And if he should mention some fair adjustment, give him your full attention. Good health to you, sir. Good sir, may heaven confound your enemies and may your joys abound. A gentle salutation. It confirms my guess that he is here to offer terms. I've always held your family most dear. I served your father, sir, for many a year. Sir, I must ask your pardon to my shame. I cannot now recall your face or name. Loyal's my name. I come from Chicopi. And I'm a bailiff in all modesty. I, for 40 years, praise God, it's been my boast to serve with honor in that vital post. And I am here, sir, if you will permit the liberty to serve you with this writ. To what? Now, please, sir, let us have no friction. It's nothing but an order of eviction. You are to move your goods and family out and make way for new occupants without deferment or delay and give the keys. I leave this house? Why, yes, sir, if you please. This house, sir, from the cellar to the roof belongs now to our good friend Tartuffe. And he is lord and master of your estate by virtue of a deed of present date, drawn in due form with the clearest legal phrasing. Your influence is utterly amazing. Young yeah, man, my business here is not with you, but with your wise and temperate father, who, like every worthy citizen, stands in awe of justice and would never obstruct the law. But not for a million, sir, would you rebel against authority. I know that well. You'll not make trouble, sir, nor interfere with the execution of my duties here. Someone may execute a smart tattoo on that black jacket of yours before you're through. Sir, bid your son be silent. I'd much regret having to mention such a nasty threat of violence in writing my report. This man's loyal of, this man loyals of the most disloyal sort. I love all men of upright character. And when I agreed to serve these papers, sir, it was 
your feelings that I had in mind. I couldn't bear to see this case assigned to someone else who might esteem you less and so subject you to unpleasantness. What's more unpleasant than telling a man to leave his house and home? You'd like a short reprieve? If you desire it, sir, I shall not press you. But wait until tomorrow to dispossess you. Splendid, I'll come and spend the night here then, most quietly with half a score of men. For form's sake, you might bring me just before you go to, get to bed the keys to the front door. My men, I promise, will be on their best behavior and will not disturb your rest. But bright and early, sir, young, you must be quick and move out all your furniture, every stick. I may be all but bankrupt, but I vow I'd give a hundred bucks here and now just for the pleasure of landing one good clout right on the end of that complacent snout. Now careful. Don't make things worse. My boots all itches to give that beggar a good kick in the breeches. Monsieur Loyal, I'd love to hear the whack of a stout stick across your fine broad back. Take care, woman. Uh, take care. A woman, too, may go to jail if she uses threatening language to a bailiff. Enough, enough, sir. This must not go on. Give me that paper, please, uh, and then be gone. Ah, uh, well, au revoir. God give you all good cheer. May God confound you and him who sent you here. Now, mother, was I right or not? This writ should change your notion of Tartuffe a bit. Do you perceive his villainy at last? Thunderstruck, I'm utterly aghast. Oh, come, be fair. You mustn't take offense at this new proof of his, of his benevolence. He's acting out of selfless love, I know. Material things enslave the soul, and so he has kindly arranged your liberation from all that might endanger your salvation. Will you not ever hold your tongue, you dunce? Come, you must take action, and at once. Go tell the world of the low trick he's tried. The gift, this deed of gift is surely nullified by such behavior, and public rage will not permit the wretch to carry out his plot. Uh, okay, uh, our young male ingenue, you're gonna do both Valère and Dami, okay? All right. Louis, away you go. Oh, sir, though I hate to bring you more bad news, such is the danger that I cannot choose. A friend who is extremely close to me and knows my interest in your family has, for my sake, presumed to violate the secrecy that's due to things of state and sends me word that you are in a plight from which your one salvation lies in flight. That scoundrel who is opposed upon you so denounced you to the court an hour ago and, as supporting evidence, displayed the strong box of a certain renegade whose secret papers so he testified you had disloyally agreed to hide I don't know just what charges may be pressed, but there's a warrant out for your arrest. Tartuffe has been instructed, furthermore, to guide the arresting officer to your door. He's clearly done this to facilitate his seizure of your house and your estate. My carriage is outside. Take you hence. This money should cover all expense. Let's lose no time, or you shall be undone. The sole defense in this case is to run. I shall go with you all the way and place you in a safe refuge to which they'll never trace you. Alas, dear boy, I wish that I could show you my gratitude for everything I owe you, but now is not the time. I pray the Lord that I may live to give you your reward. Farewell, my dears. Be careful. Brother, hurry. We shall take care of things. You needn't worry. Uh, I'll do Tartuffe. Gently, sir. Gently, stay right where you are. I think I got to do Trump, right? <laughs> Amazing, <laughs> spectacular, just the best. Gently, sir. Gently stay right where you are. No need for haste. Your lodging isn't far. You're off to prison by the order of the judge. This is the crowning blow and sense, you sludge. It means my total ruin and defeat. Your villainy is now at last complete. You needn't add it. You needn't try to provoke me. It's no use. Those who serve heaven must expect abuse. You are indeed most patient, sweet, and blameless. How he exploits the name of heaven. It's shameless. Your taunts and mockeries are all for naught. You do my duty, 
and it's my only thought. Your love of duty is most meritorious, meritorious. and what you have done is little short of glorious. All deeds are glorious, madam, which obey his honor who sent me here today. I rescued you when you were destitute. Have you forgotten that, you thankless brute? No, no, I remember every tort. But my first duty is to serve the court. The obligation is so paramount to other claims beside it do not count. And for it, I would sacrifice my wife, my family, my friend, and my own life. Hypocrite. All that we most revere, he uses to cloak his plots and camouflage his bruises. If it is true that you are animated by pure and loyal zeal, as you have stated, why, why was this zeal not roused until you sought to make Orgona cuckold and being caught? Why weren't you moved to give your evidence until your outraged host had driven you hence? I shan't say that the gift of this treasure ought to have damped your zeal in any measure, but he is a traitor, as you declare. How could you condescend to be his heir? Sir, spare me all this clamor. It's growing shrill. Please carry out your orders, if you will. It's the uh, officer. Somebody else to the officer. Yes, I've delayed too long, sir. Thank you kindly. You're just the proper person to remind me. Come, you are off to join the other boarders in a dank prison, according to his orders. Who? I? Sir? Yes. To prison? This can't be true. I have an explanation, but not to you. Sir, all is well. Rest easy and be grateful. We serve a leader to whom all sham is hateful, a leader who sees into our inmost hearts and can't be fooled by any trickster's arts. His deep soul, though generous and human, views all things with discernment and acumen. His sovereign reason is not lightly swayed and all his judgments are discreetly weighed. Betraying you, the rogue stood self-betrayed. Our officers soon recognized Tartuffe as one notorious by another name who'd done so many vicious crimes that one could fill 10 volumes with them and be writing still. But to be brief, the judge was appalled by this man's treachery toward you, which he called the last worst villainy of a vile career and bade me follow the imposter here to see how gross his impudence could be and force him to restore your property your private papers by the court's command, I hereby seize and give into your hand. The court both revokes and invalidates the deed which gave this rascal your estates and pardons. Furthermore, your grave offense in harboring an exile's documents. By these decrees, the court rewards you for your courageous deeds in the late war and shows how heartfelt is his satisfaction in recompensing any worthy action, how much he prizes merit, and how he makes more of men's virtues than of their mistakes. Heavens be praised. I'll breathe again at last. We're safe. I can't believe the danger is past. Well, traitor, now you see. Ah, brother, please, let's not descend to such indignities. Leave the poor wretch to his unhappy fate, and don't say anything to aggravate his present woes rather hope that he will soon embrace a, an honest piety. Well said. Let's go at once and gladly kneeling, express the gratitude which all are feeling. Then when that first great duty has been done, we'll turn with pleasure to a second one and give Valère, whose love has proven so true, the wedded happiness, which is his due. The comedy ends dancing, with a dance. Dancing. <laughs> dance break. Dancing. <laughs> Thoughts? Wow. That's a lot. That's, we got that done in, in less than two hours. So good work, everybody. Yeah, that was, it's a five act play that we bolted through. Cold reading. You were, you were all fantastic. That was so much fun. Mm -hmm. What a, what an allegory, huh? Hmm. Let me explain the, uh, the literary happy convention for those of you who don't know what's going on at the end of that play. This is something that's called deus ex machina. <laughs> okay. And so how, how we would eventually use that, there's a lot of ways. It could be the Southern District of New York 
that is represented that comes to arrest Trump. It could be, he could just have an I voted badge. It could be, I think the voters that are flown in to rescue the situation, right? I hope. Yeah. So, uh, so to all our American friends in there, the message is clear. Vote. Uh, yeah, it's my first election. I'm excited. Your first one. So excited. Yeah. <laughs> just I so just funny. voted in the primary for my state. Woo. Yeah. Um, I hope I didn't believe the first time Trump was actually clear. I checked. It was one of the first American election. I was actually looking a little bit more and thinking, how can this clown be elected? And I was just like, what? What's wrong with people? Good question. Uh, the, what's wrong with people? What's wrong with the media? What's wrong with what? What's wrong with the Democratic Party? That you know, yeah, it's just it's just a mess. But uh, as far as this play goes, I've got some archetypes in mind. Obviously, Trump is our guy. Laurent is supposed to be in there. I wanted a Stephen Miller. He didn't have a single line, did he? Louis, are you still here? Gallery view. Yeah, he didn't have any lines. Not one line. They talk about him, but in the beginning, yeah, yeah he didn't have one line. Okay, so archetypes, I want you to think of, like like, like I've said, for Uncle Sam, Organa's Uncle Sam, uh, and for uh, Elmir. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm seeing uh, the Statue of Liberty, Lady Liberty as the feminine archetype of beauty and, and the last thing that America would want to see ravaged by Trump, right? But the hot-headed son, the reasonable brother, is it, is there, like, my first thought on the reasonable brother would be Justin Trudeau, maybe, <laughs> but that's the Canadian in me. <laughs> <laughs> so take it away and think about it. And I, I'm open to any suggestions about this, but you see how it fits if we set this in the White House, right? Definitely. Yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, get your creative thinking caps on and look at the character list. Uh, like Doreen, what a wonderful character. And, and if we have a black actress play that character, sassy and black and just like not putting up with any of the bullshit, the, the modern black, all black lives matter, oh, sorry, black lives matter woman playing that role. I think would be a very strong choice, right? This is my, my thought. I welcome your thoughts. You don't have to give them to me now. I need more woke people to tell me what to do. I'm an old man. This is true. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Y'all better come out and watch me play hockey. And you say, how is that old man doing that? <laughs> All right, uh, so uh, we run a little bit late, it's quarter after eight, so I wanna thank everybody for your hard work tonight. Uh, I'll take a look at the video and, uh, and maybe post it if, if it worked out. I don't know, because I was reading the script. I don't know what the camera was doing, so I'll stop recording now. So good to say good night, everybody. Good night.